Uh, this is where we're talking, we're doing a series on God. That's kind of what I've uh, been led to, I think. And it's interesting in talking with Deba and some of the boys, it's like in Africa, there's no such thing as an atheist. It's like, even the criminals, it's like they still believe in God, right? In America, about 25% of our population claim to be atheists now. I mean, that's huge. So, I mean, we, and 25% are churchgoers. So we've got this big middle section, but 25% folks don't believe in God. And so I think it's important for us as believers to sort of know who God is and know what we believe and why we believe. And last week we talked about, we, we just finished the omnis. So we did omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. So, uh, and just as a review, omnipotent means what? All powerful, omniscience means all knowing and omnipresence. So here's the thing. So God is, and, and the point of all of that sort of as a review is many times we think God's everywhere. And as a kid, I was thinking, oh crap, God's everywhere. You know, <laughs> he sees everything I do. And it's like, and I had the picture of the big guy in the white beard with taken notes just furiously. It's like, oh, we could have done that better. Oh, that was wrong. You know, that is not the point of omnipresence or omniscience or any of these things. The point is, is the one who loves you most is near you no matter where you go. And I love the picture that Michelangelo painted, but I think that I'm gonna talk about it a little bit, but there is this thing where, so let's just examine it, I'm sure you've all seen it before, but the point of the picture is the fingers, right? If you look at God's finger, it is straining to touch. And if you look at man's finger, it is indolent and lazy. And all we have to do is lift a finger. And we're going to talk a lot about that tonight, about lifting the finger. But uh, that didn't come out right. <laughs> we are the gathering, but still, that was a bridge too far. I'm sorry about that. Yes, sir. Hey, real quick, uh, when we were going through the series of Omni, of the Omni uh, mm -hmm. series, uh, I remember there was a revelation I had in my 20s, I think I was reading C.S. Lewis, about, yeah. about the uh, my misunderstanding of Satan and how much credit we give Satan and how we always think that Satan is everywhere, but he can't be. No. Because he's not omnipresent. Right. He can only be in one place. And yeah. he's not all powerful, so he's yeah. not, and he's not all knowing. He just knows enough. And he has that he rely on truths. Yeah. And uh, so it's really, really good to know that we believe in God who is what he is all the time. Yeah, Satan is not the opposite of God. Right. He is lesser than. But God is all of those things. So here, here is the thing that I, the, the thing that's kind of interesting about the theology of the picture, okay, is this is called the creation of Adam. But if this was in line with my sort of theology, with what I believe, Adam and God wouldn't be separated, right? Adam and God were in the same little sphere. In the garden, when God made man and put them together, we were, we were together. There wasn't, he didn't, we didn't have to reach out and touch his hand. We were with him and we knew what God knew. So this is an important thing to remember. When God created all of creation, what did he say at the end of everything he made? What was the it's pronouncement? Good. It's good. Did God make bad stuff? No, he made good stuff, right? So the intention of God, the heart of God and the person of God is good. And this is a hard thing to believe sometimes, right? And I wanna talk about how the one picture, the one circle became two because it's a thing we don't think about a lot and it's really important. There is a, th so, and the reason I say it's important is well, I'm having some trouble with the connection. Okay, <laughs> serious talk. I'm having a great night, folks, I'm telling you. I don't know why that happened, but anyway. Uh, um, it's right. I'm getting the word of knowledge right there. 
So anyway, so we got these two circles and they were together. And the whole, and so what was the temptation? Because this is really big. What was the temptation in the garden that she, that, that Satan tempted man to do? What was it that he said, this is the thing? Knowledge of... So Bonhoeffer in his work Ethics says prior to the fall, there was no such thing as good and evil. Because God, everything God knows is good. Even the things that we would say are evil are a perversion of the good, but in the light of God, they would be good. So the whole duality, the whole duality of our life didn't exist in the garden. There was just man and God and we were good. Did man, was man created to be sick? No. Was man created to die? No. So, what do you call beings that don't die and never get sick and are in perfect fellowship with God? What do we call those? Immortal. Immortal. We were made to be little, sort of, we were made in the image of God, right? Here is the thing. I don't think we appreciate how much we lost in the fall. When man fell, the immortal was ripped out of him. And there is a deep, deep ache for us to return to what we were created to be. And that ache is the thing that causes all the angst and the yearning and the confusion and the problems because we know that where I am and the way this thing is work is not the way it's supposed to be, right? So this is, we are not in the place that we're supposed to be. That's a big deal, isn't it? So you're walking around life going, man, it feels like it should be better than this. And why does it feel that way? Because it should be. We weren't meant to live in this situation. So, well, anyway. So what happened? I think it's interesting in computers. What's the language of, you're a computer guy, what's the base, the basis of all computer language? You read it? It's binary, right? It's ones or zeros. It's binary. It's good or it's bad. We were in a non-binary world prior to the fall. But with the fall, Satan said, you can now know good and evil. You can see his perspective and you can see my perspective. Knowing that, I, I'm going to tell, I guess, a personal story that my little sister shares. So, uh, so here's the thing about Generation X, which is kind of her passion. Do you know that 37% of Generation X was, has been sexually abused? 37% has been sexually abused. Sherry was one of those, 37%, in an early relationship when she was dating. And I remember when Sherry first told me the story, to my shame, I was like, it's kind of normal. What happened to you is not all that out of norm. And I'm not going to go into the details, but it's like, and then I realized shame on me that I have been so messed up in my life that the stuff that damages us all sexually, I've just gotten used to. And I think it's something you should get over. And I didn't realize what an affront it was. And then, and then for her, and for many people, once that threshold's been crossed, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, a thing is awakened. And you struggle with sexuality for a long, long time. Well, I guess what I'm saying is that we have this, we, we, have, we have lived in a world where that the evil that is being done to us and that we are called to walk in, a lot of times we don't even recognize it as being evil anymore. Amen. We see it as just a coping mechanism. And so many people are walking in this evil 
that we don't realize, and we are too, that we don't realize the severe blow that is being caused by our separation from God. So the whole deal of these two, of Adam and God not being together, man, that is a heartache that has lasted over the eons. And every child, when he comes into the world, there is that separation from, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Man, I cannot get my notes here. Okay, so let's go to the next slide anyway. So it's a binary world. And what I want us to talk about is the gap. So there is a space between God reaching out for man and man being separated from God. And it says, oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. So here is the thing why it's important to believe that God is good. What is the thing that we want more than anything else? This is the ultimate church answer. Yeah, we want God. So this part of us was this connection that we had in the, in the garden, and I hope this isn't too esoteric, but it really is important to get. We were made to be in perfect union with God. We didn't have to look for him. We were in per we knew what he knew. We, we knew the things that he know, knows, knew. Something louder than that. Help me with the transition on that. And, it, and we long to know the way God knows. And we don't. And so we struggle to figure things out on our own all the time, right? And we realize I am not smart enough to get it. And we want so much to be connected to God. But we don't always know that it's God we're longing for. Is that true? Yes. What are some things... Help me with that. What are some things that we try to substitute in the place of God? Relationships. Really? Wow. Yeah. How many people wanted a spouse that they really wanted to God? How many people look for a relationship to be the answer that only God can provide? <laughs> Is that an amen, Mark? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay, that's good. Relationships. What else? What is another thing that we try to slide into the longing for God? Money. Money. Wow, is that... Man, in our world, in America, isn't that true? It's like, I'd like to know God or I'd just like to have a lot of money. So, yeah, money. What's another thing we throw into that slide? Pleasure. How's that? How do we throw pleasure in there? So many different ways. Sex, or just keeping yourself distracted with things that feel good, mentally, emotionally. You know, just. Yeah. Some people constantly travel, some people constantly party, some people, you know, constantly. <clears throat> Or fill in that gap with something that feels good. And yeah. Well, God is the archetype. You know, God is the, 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 the best possible, you know, to use something like Aquinas or something like that. It's like he's like I'm the best person. possible. That, you know. So everything else is just a cheap invitation. And it could be anything. You know, it, it's just a matter of what each individual person values or what they've fallen into. You know, yeah. and it, sometimes the things that we value are because we've fallen into things and all of a sudden now we value these things more than, you know. But, yeah. you know, God is the the perfect example, the all-good, all-powerful, ever-present, and everything else is just poorly trying to match that. Yeah. And I know we've heard that a million times, but I think it's a thing to... What I'm trying to do in this series, or when we talk about it, is to get us to sort of see with fresh eyes again 
but we're trading for God. So yes, this, the Aquinas quote, which I skipped on the previous slide, is that God is the highest good. Yeah, God is the highest good. That's a key principle for Christianity for all. So it's the highest good. So what does the word highest imply? Nothing higher. Yeah, no, period. And that there are lesser goods, right? Right. It, it, it implies comparison and a scale. So now we have a pendulum. We have, a, we have good and we have evil. Here's the thing that will blow your mind, which I, th I think. So you're all the way down to the gates of hell. Is there still good present there? God is in the whole journey. It's just lesser and lesser and lesser good. Harder and harder to find. I believe that hell is the absence of God. I believe that God, I think you go to hell because you want to. I think God says, you know what, if you don't want me, I have tried, <laughs> you know. I am now going to let you s step out of the realm of my grace. Because even people who don't believe in God have grace, right? Yeah. Even people that don't believe in God still have the benefit of God's presence being among us. Absolutely. Because as long as there are two or more that are gathered, yeah. and his Man. presence is, is, is here. And whether you believe that or not, you get the benefit. God Amen. causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, right? Well, because God is good. Yeah, go ahead. We've talked about God's omnipresence. I mean, he's everywhere. Yeah. I, you know, it's like I think he shows up in special ways when we get together with other brothers and sisters. But I mean, he's everywhere. Whether you're yeah. sitting there by yourself or amongst hundreds. And, yeah, it's... My whole thing about this is, is that as long as we're in this realm, God is present everywhere. And hell is the place. So as we talked about in the uh, power talk our last time about quarks and how the very, the smallest element of, of a physical existence is a, is a sound. And I think it's intriguing that God spoke the world into existence. And so what if the smallest part of everything is the sound of God's voice? And hell is when you finally step away from the sound of God's voice. Mm -hmm. And it becomes what it was before God said the first word, which was chaos was over the face of the deep, right? Darkness and chaos. And then God spoke and changed it. But prior to that, and I believe that's what hell is, is when you finally step away from his presence. So it's a sliding scale. It's the closer you get to God, the closer you get to good. The farther away you are from God, the less you can see the good, right? Okay, these are important things because we are called then to an aspirational life, right? The Christian life is an aspirational life. I remember Rich was talking to one of my, my buddy, Rich Mullins, was talking to one of his friends back when we were in college. And he was telling about how it's like, you know, the, I go to these bars and stuff and everybody just accepts, accepts me the way I am. And it's like, well, yeah, but... They don't have any. They don't have any expectations for you at all. You know, it's like they don't care if you don't do anything. <laughs> that if you step into an aspirational life, there is a sense in which, yeah, I am a hypocrite because I can never be the thing I want to be. Mm -hmm. But I'm always trying to be better than the thing I am, mm -hmm. and I'm not doing that so I can go to heaven, right? Because am I going to go to heaven because I, I, I'm good? Mm -hmm. No, I'm saved by grace. Why do I want to be good? Because I want to be good. Because I want to be good. But why do I want to be good? Because you're closer to God. Closer to God. So the pure in heart will see God. My behavior allows me to see God. And here's the thing about being good. Isn't it nice to see somebody who's living a good life for God? Isn't that encouraging? We, we want to be good for one another. We want to be good to encourage the brothers and sisters. We want to be good so people can see, oh, that's what a life surrendered to God looks like. I really find that valuable. So here's the thing. We desperately want God, and we desperately fear lifting the finger, the forefinger, too. <laughs> because when we do that, we give up control of our lives. Right? It says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Yeah, go. Because, you know, the idea of good and doing good and getting 
closer to God, you know, it's a, it's a slippery slope in there because we, we think that from our humanness, we know what good is. And so we see someone and we say, well, they're good and they're closer to God. Or we think, well, look at this and this, you know. Yeah. I'm doing this, even if it's not a, a much of a doing thing, you know, we, we say that's good, but like, good is just a heart level. And when you really look at it and it's serving the orphan and the widow and taking up your cross and following me, it's, there's no glory to good. There's no like, look at me, I'm goodness. It's just... It's a really hard road to good, and, and I think on the outside, not you can't see. I mean, the fruits of someone. I think you can see the fruits, you know? But you can't make, you can't fake fruit. You know, you can't make the fruit be there for very long. You can fake it for a while, but then, I don't know. I, I'm not sure we know what good looks like. We're going to get there. I think we do. I'm going to posit an example of what God good looks like at the end. So. And you can tell me whether you buy it or not. So. Well, Bridget. All right. So I want to talk just a little bit about. I think we have a hard time recognizing that what we really want is God. I think we have a hard time recognizing that. And I just want to read a kind of a lengthy quote, but it's one of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis. And so it's from The Weight of Glory. Have you all read The Weight of Glory? I really think the way of glory shouldn't canonize. So it's like, you know, uh, but I, I, you can follow along. This is one of the great section. But I think that when we talk about good, the way God, good manifests itself in our world is through beauty. And uh, so this is Lewis. It says, in speaking of, our, of this desire for our own far off country, which we find in ourselves even now, I feel a certain shyness. I am almost committing an indecency. I am trying to rip open the inconsolable secret in each one of you. The secret which hurts so much that you take your revenge on it by calling names like nostalgia and romanticism and adolescence. The secret which also pierces with such sweetness that in a very intimate conversation, the minute it becomes imminent, we grow awkward and affect to laugh at ourselves. The secret we cannot hide and cannot tell, though we desire to do both. We cannot tell it because it is a desire for something that we have never actually appeared in our experience. And we cannot hide it because our experience is constantly suggesting it. And we betray ourselves like lovers at the mention of a name. Our commonest expedience is to call it beauty and behave as if that has settled the matter. Wordsworth expedient was to identify with certain moments in his, past, in his own past but all of this is a cheat. If Wordsworth would have gone back to those moments in the past, he would have found not the thing itself, but only the reminder of it. What he would have remembered would turn out self, itself to be a remembering. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will, will betray us if we trusted them. It is not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. When I was, I remember when I was with my kids, this is years ago, we were on the Monon Trail. We all had inline skates and I had Kaylee, you were in the little, remember that little stroller thing we had, the green thing with the two big wheels and I would push you and so we were on the Monon Trail. I was pushing him in the skates. It was a fall day. It was like, it was gorgeous and I was coming up over the creek that was like the first creek there between here and Broad Ripple and it was like, I remember stopping and just looking at the sun glittering off the creek and I had my girls with me and it was like, oh my gosh, this is like one of those most beautiful moments I've ever experienced in my life. And I remember I began to think about them. God, thank you for letting me have these kids. And, thank you. and then a bug flew in my eye. <laughs> and I thought, that's exactly the way it is with us, right? We can begin to touch it for just a moment, that all of creation 
is dancing with God. And we want so much to join the dance, to be in the goodness that is him. And we can almost touch it for a moment. And then a bug flies in our eye. And then the fallenness of the world slaps us in the face. And we realize I am not part of the dance, but I was made to be a part of the dance. So I guess to get to your thing, it is not about our behavior, it is about loving God. And he's going to instill himself in us. And the more that we love him, the more he will transform us in ways that we're not even aware of. So to your point, the more we try to move from the knowledge of good and evil, and it's our knowledge and our discerning the good and evil, we will likely mess it up. And some of the worst tyrants in the world were the people who believed they were doing good to people. And so they never stopped the pain and the insanity, right? But God is good. And when you touch him, he begins to transform you in ways and will lead you into good. And to the point, I have seen self-righteousness and I have seen righteousness. Mm -hmm. And I can tell the difference. Yes. Amen. I can tell there are people who are doing it for a show and there are people who are doing it because it's just in them to do it. And what's in them is the Lord. And the Lord has changed them in ways that they can't help but let his goodness flow out. Not that they're perfect, but you can tell that their heart is aligned with God. So how do we do this? I want to just read a couple of scriptures that I think are very, very key. The first is Ephesians 4, 23 through 32. It says, instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. So we were disconnected with God. So the spirit of God wasn't present, right? Now we're going to let the spirit renew us. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Here is some practical advice. Stop telling lies. That's good, isn't it? Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. For all are parts of the same body and don't sin by letting anger control you. This is really practical stuff, right? Don't let the sun go down while you're so angry for anger gives a foothold to the devil. I like this next one. If you're a thief, quit stealing. <laughs> Instead, use your hands for good work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Oh man, it's hard to be tender-hearted in a mean world, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Forgiving one another, just as God through Christ forgave you. And then Philippians 4, 8, and now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. I think that's really practical stuff, right? What are you thinking about? And it's not about, it's just oh, what the pure in heart see God. The more that you can think on the things of God, the more he can begin to come in and change us. Here is the, so the final slide is the mystery of God's goodness. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our father, who created all the lights in the heavens and he never changes or casts a shifting shadow. So what's good in the world is God and everything that we have in our life is a gift from him and he is good and the biggest gift he gave us was his son jesus right because with jesus we get a chance to get a new heart it says in is it isaiah your heart of stone he'll turn to flesh 
that we have this heart of stone. We've become hard-hearted hard -hearted and cruel. Ezekiel. It's Ezekiel, thank you. Yes, yeah, the dry bones, right before the dry bones. Yeah, Ezekiel, but this heart of flesh. Don't you want to have a heart of flesh? Mm -hmm. Aren't you tired of having a heart of stone? That is the gift God gives. If you will accept his son, if you will lift your finger to touch his hand, right? He will change you from the stony, hard, self-righteous, self-important person that you tend to be. And he will transform you into a person who is loved by the king and whose love changes everything. So God is good and the rest of the world is not. But God is good, right? All the time. Isn't that what the church used to say? God is good all, all, all the time. All the time. Yeah, God good. is good. Hallelujah, right? So when things are so confusing, remember, God is good. And if you don't understand it and you think that it's not going to make any sense, the truth is God is good and he will work it out and he will make a way for you because he's promised to. And the main way, the first way and the biggest way that he made is through his son, Jesus. So we're going to go to communion. Communion is, it is a good gift from God. Communion is where we remember what Jesus did for us. So I'm going to pray, and if you're ready or when you're ready, you can just come and we uh, break off the little cracker and dip it in the juice. And, but when you do, just remember who Jesus is and how he made a difference. And I love the little picture of the big heart because it's all about changing our heart. So, dear Lord, we are grateful for the way you love us. And Lord, I pray right now that if there are that you will just do your work in this time. And Lord, I pray that uh, if we are separated from you, that you will bring us back. Lord, I pray that we will want to grasp your hand. I pray that we will not resist, that we will not be stiff-necked and proud, but we will humble ourselves and admit that you are King of kings and Lord of lords and that you loved us enough that you humbled yourself and took on a, the very image of a man and then humbled yourself further even to death on a cross and therefore God exalted you and gave you a name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and King to the glory of God the Father. Father, we know that we are the firstborn of many sons. You are the firstborn of many sons and daughters and that we want to be just like you. And we want to be returned and restored to the intention that you had for us in the garden. We want our world to be in your world. We want your kingdom to come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And let it start by the renewing of our minds. As we take this cracker that represents your body that was broken, and we take the juice to represent your blood that was shed. May the life that was resurrected in you be resurrected in us. And make us new in your image. In Jesus' name, amen. Partake whenever you're ready.